and I spent many hours kicking a rugby ball when I was at school. I used to stay behind every practice. I used to, you know, work on the weekends. I was very, very fortunate. Again, my um, I'll never forget him. He's my uh, original first 15 rugby coach. Uh, was a little Welshman, uh, <laughs> and obviously they. They love their rugby, so he he was he, he really pushed me. We practiced no end, and and one of the things I, I thank him for was that although I could kick ambidextrously at the time because of my football background, he actually you know made me really focus on both feet. And so in my early years playing in in the 15s in the Premiership, I used to kick to the touchline off either foot, right touchline, left foot, left touchline, right foot. You know, some people won't do that so much nowadays, but I, I, it did. It installed a confidence, and I felt very comfortable with, with with kicking. And then adapting it with the drop kick became a fairly easy transition for me. So I think if I look back at it, I think the hours I just spent kicking the ball. And then I was fortunate. I had a few good people that uh, didn't overcoach me, but coached me well, tweaked me and gave me the right focus. And so more often than not, I would always back myself. Today's guest is England legend Ben Gollings. He is a world record holder for most points scored on the HSBC World Rugby 7 Series, which earned him a place in the Guinness Book of World Records. Gollings represented England at the 2005 and 2009 Sevens World Cups, as well as three Commonwealth Games. In total, England has won 19 World 7 Series tournaments. Gollings was part of 16, including four Hong Kong titles. In 15s, he played over 100 English Premiership matches and represented many other teams around the world in his illustrious career. In today's episode, we chat about how he overcame adversity at a young age, his love for kicking anything and everything, and how he balanced a decade on the Sevens World Series while playing professional 15s. We talk about his England Sevens dream team, his top seven selections from all the opponents he faced, and we also get into the mental side of the game and life after playing. Gollings was one of the greatest players we've ever seen, and it's no wonder co-host Robin McDowell has a framed photo of him in his bedroom. Here is England legend Ben Gollings. He's so dangerous, Freddy Krueger has nightmares about him! Hello and welcome to the Rugby Hive. I'm Dallin Stanford, and despite my South African accent, I was fortunate enough to play rugby for the United States on the Sevens World Series. And I'm Robin McDowell, a former Canadian Sevens International. Back in my playing days, I went head-to-head against Dallin and the USA. For several years, Robin has coached international Sevens for various countries, including Canada and Mexico. He's massively passionate about growing the game across the Americas through his McDowell rugby programs at all levels. I'm currently a commentator for World Rugby, most recently broadcasting the Rugby World Cup in Japan, as well as the amazing Sevens World Series. More than a decade later, we are teaming up to bring you insights from legendary players and coaches from around the world. All legends have a story. The Rugby Hive podcast is here to share it. Welcome to the Hive. Oh, it's more dangerous than climate change. Hello and welcome to episode number 23. This is our second last episode of 2020 as we close out season one of the Rugby Hive. And what an episode we have with one of the all-time greats, Ben Gollings. I remember the early days on the Sevens World Series watching Ben as the ultimate playmaker, setting up most of England's successful era has ever seen. And then years later, I got the opportunity to get rounded by him like a park car in the Seven Series. I um, mean, one such story we tell during this episode. But what I keenly remember is just watching his support lines. When he was with England, it looked like he had energy to play every single minute of every single match, including those 20-minute finals, which we get into later. So my vivid memory takes me back to Dubai Sevens. And I was watching Ben in particular. They moved the ball across the line to their speedster. They had many, but of course, Dan Norton is one that stands out. Norton burns his man in his away, but a sweeper to beat, he's looking for support on the inside. So I ignored watching Norton during that whole episode and watched Ben as he tracked across the field. He timed his line to perfection. And there he was, received the pass, scores underneath the upright bangs over the conversion and to him it looked so simple but of course you could see the line the vision everything he had just such a special player you know he obviously has sublime skill Uh, he's a great person fantastic coach now and a great ambassador on the series as well a top top person robin i can't say enough about him and and you obviously read me the whole episode because i'm uh I'm a fanboy of Ben and uh, just really respect the man. Uh, but I, I, I've been thinking about it since obviously we recorded uh, a while back here and, 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 and re-listening um, over the last few weeks and, and talking with Ben. But the crazy thing is like, if it was any other sport or any other era, like he's up there with the Kobe's and, and, and the Michael Jordans and obviously the Cerevis and the Wilkinson's and truly one of the best sportsmen of all time. 
and uh, you know, he didn't have it easy coming up, which is, you know, he's got kind of his dream leave succeed uh, recipe in there as well, which, which will be very inspiring for so many kids. But the thing that always impressed me was how consistent he was, you know, like you say, he would set up a Dan Orton, he would run that line, he would score the try, he'd kick the conversion and then he'd nail the restart perfectly. Like everything he did was airtight. And so we dive into that in the episode for those, those coaches out there and obviously those athletes and for coaches out there, most of us guys and girls know how to teach people how to kick and, and, you know, all the cues, but it's the consistency piece. And then also his will to win, uh, watching him win in Hong Kong, uh, in double overtime and then playing in double overtime the next week in Singapore against Fiji again, and just his will to win. And alongside obviously Amor was, uh, was just world-class. And then of course they had unlimited, uh, weapons around them that, uh, that, that we were all envious of at that time. But, uh, yeah, pretty special guy. He had some personal special memories as well with his kids. Yeah, he did. So uh, we were on a call with him last night, actually, uh, just catching up uh, with the holidays. And, and he was sharing with uh, a group of Canadian coaches that his his career highlights essentially is, uh, you know, running or running out or walking out and twicking him uh, in, the, in a 15s match sold out show against New Zealand barbarians uh, with his young boys, uh, Woody and Rocco. And uh, over over COVID, when the U.S. was getting locked down, uh, he, he got his boys back in Australia. So he's got, his, he had his two boys with him and, uh, Woody just graduated, just graduating from high school and Rocco was, is 15 and, and he actually got to play a full 80 minutes with them, uh, in a, in a men's game a couple months ago. And he just said like, it was, it was pretty special. He was hoping just to get a few minutes here and there, but he ended up running the whole 80 minutes, of course, because just like you said, how, how fit he is, but, uh, yeah, pretty touching moments for a proud dad. And, and we'll definitely be following the, the stories of his boys as they come through. Yeah, the Golling's name will live on forever. And then this week, we had some questions from the great Ryan Kirby on Twitter. But it's a barn burning, busy week for us with the holiday season. So we'll chat about the Great Britain Sevens next week. And amazing to see England, Scotland, Wales reviving their Sevens programs ahead of the Tokyo Olympics. And we just got to thank all our supporters, especially Gilbert Rugby Canada, Brand Marinade, and Focus Care Products. You can catch us on the socials at Rugby Hive on Twitter and Facebook, at My Rugby Hive on Insta. We want to wish everybody a happy holiday. Make sure you're safe out there. Wishing everybody's family the best and keep spreading love around the world. It's time now for episode number 23. Ben, thanks so much for joining us on the Rugby Hive. It's a real privilege to have somebody that has stepped both of us and rounded us like park cars. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> how, uh, how are you, you doing? How are you Thank doing you that guys. side? Pleasure, my friend. How are you doing that side uh, during this current uh, crazy global situation? Oh, look, I think it's a bit, I mean, obviously it has been a bit interesting, but I think we've been very fortunate here in Australia. We've been a bit of a bubble. And we've not really seen, I think, what has been seen in the rest of the world. So for us, we've, we've still been able to move around. And, I, you know, we, we adapted pretty quickly. We were very fortunate that my, my uh, daughter's school at the time was probably... At the, at the forefront of making some good decisions they made the uh, transition pretty easy and so we've you know we've been still been able to enjoy the water here close to the water with the beach which has been nice and, and we've not been restricted to kind of say a, a one hour get out of the house and that's all you can do it's, it, it has been we have been very fortunate but i think one of the interesting ones is i got my sons arrived back from the u.s right at the beginning of april and we had uh, a close call in being able to just get them into our state before they closed every airline which was fun but that's good having them back but we've i think the same token it's been a really nice time to adapt and kind of reconnect with family and, and for me actually i found it really nice to just be able to slow down a little bit give life a little bit of a different focus yeah we've all been on the road for a long long time can you tell us a bit about your four kids and your lovely wife lauren and clearly she's fitter than you <laughs> uh, if you ask my son it's like dad you can't beat her up so don't go there <laughs> uh, oh, no, look, um, no, I'm, I'm very fortunate a lovely family two elder sons uh, woody and rocker just turned 17 and 15 funny enough they, they, they were they were both born in the week of hong kong so it's only been really recently I've ever enjoyed a birthday with them. So they'll, they'll, they'll like me for that. And then my, my younger daughter, Amelia, who's five now, and, and Luca, who's uh, bringing everybody up from behind the little three-year-old. He's He's been fantastic. And then, yeah, uh, my wife, absolutely, Lauren, she, she's been brilliant. <clears throat> and she's a great motivation for me because uh, she does, she really enjoys her fitness. And uh, she puts me through my paces. I won't get in the boxing ring, you know, I refuse. But I don't think I can take any more hits to the head. That's my excuse. 
but you were very lucky here. Got a lovely, lovely place. We live here on the Gold Coast uh, and, and, and a fun family. It's great. Love, love that you got, got all four of them together and uh, we'll get your boys on their way soon as far as the, the World Series, I'm sure. So Ben, what was your hometown back in England and, and what sports and hobbies did you get into growing up? My original hometown was, was a place called Launceston in Cornwall. That's where I was born, which is, uh, if you know the UK, Cornwall's a very uh, different place. And so having grown up, the Cornish boys uh, liked to, to claim me in the UK as, uh, as one of their own. But I spent most of my years in um, a place called Dorset, uh, Bournemouth, which is right on the south coast. Again, beachy, beachy area, stunning, stunning area. But for me, growing up was really different. And not a lot of people know probably this side of it. But I was uh, an extreme asthmatic. So from the age of three, I was diagnosed. And I was actually trying to chase around my five uh, four elder brothers and one younger brother, but uh, not so successfully. I spent quite a lot of time in and out of hospital, had a couple of near-death experiences, actually, but not that I remember of, but certainly my parents have told me about. Um, so it was quite a slow start, should we say, in that regard, but I was very fortunate. I had uh, some very close medical attention given to me. I was put on test drugs that kind of were, you know, were a miracle, really, in terms of the way it transformed Myself, I, I was unable to run the length of the rubble pitch without breaking down with an asthma attack and on all sorts of medical devices. But then, uh, yeah, this really changed it. And I guess a bit like a jack in the box. The minute uh, I was able to run around, I never looked back. And so having watched my brothers do it for a long time, sport was a passion. And it didn't really matter what. I just loved being outside running around. I, I kicked holes in my parents' fence. I think I whacked enough tennis balls against the garage door and lucky enough to live close enough to the golf course to swung a golf ball everything and anything was my passion at that time growing up and can you remember your first rugby game and you mentioned your, your siblings did they play rugby before you is that how you found the sport yeah so admittedly we probably had a again being in the uk at the time it was a it was a much bigger football influence so my first real touches of, of, of playing team sport were in football when we moved to dorset dorset uh, in particular although they now have premiership team in bournemouth that football was never around. It was more rugby. So I did watch my brothers play local rugby. They played for the local rugby club. And my first game was at the age of about, I'm trying to think now, maybe 11 or 12 for my junior school. And I was actually, at the time, I'd come from football. And uh, so they just said, I'll oh, just go on the wing and run. <laughs> um, and I guess I, I knew how to do that reasonably well. Now that the, the lungs were allowing. But I guess... Moving very quickly, I found out that you know my football skills translated pretty well, and I I, I didn't want to be stuck out in the wing too long, and, and I actually wanted to get in the thick of it. But uh, yeah, I think it was an interesting game running around. I was I was able to handle myself reasonably well at that age. I was actually quite big for my age, but then I stopped growing. <laughs> and that's that's fascinating, right? To hear the background because our next question here is about your record points uh, scoring ability. I mean, it's unbelievable that still to this day. And you retired many years ago. You're still the highest point scorer ever on the HSBC Sevens World Series with 2,652 points. How did you manage to keep that form over such an extended period of time, well over a decade? And then secondly to that, can you give us some of your highlights? I know there are lots of them, but uh, this is only an hour-long show. So keep your highlights to a minimum. <laughs> well, I think some of my highlights are fairly obvious. But I, I, for me, I think keeping the form was just a hunger to you know, always keep being as, as good as you can be. Points thing never really came into mind, but in the latter years, I think it's always good to have good motivators and good personal stimulators. You know, you've got your team goals. My personal goal was to was to keep knocking that up because I think that kept, that kind of kept me honest with myself and sharp. It wasn't a selfish, I'm going to score as many points. I don't, <laughs> I don't think it was that case. I wouldn't never pass the ball if it meant I had to. That certainly, yeah. It certainly um, gave me a little bit of a thing. And I think really in the back of my mind, I was like, if I can push this out as high as I can. I, I wanted to make 3,000. So I thought, you know, people coming behind me in the latter years, it was something to push for. You know, why Sali Sarevi was the original setter of that record. But looking at highlights for me, you know, I think my first full senior premiership game back at Harlequins was, was a highlight. Obviously, it was a dream for me to want to be a professional athlete and it happened to be in the rugby world. So that was a, a highlight, obviously, playing in front of a, a relatively home crowd. But then as, as time went by, I think the first win in Hong Kong in 2002 was, was pretty special. I think more so for the fact that with England at that time, we weren't, other than they won the World Cup in 93, which is a little bit before my time, we hadn't really been doing anything. And then to go and win the prestigious crown of the Hong Kong Sevens was 
a big uh, catalyst to what came came after. The the other highlight then was probably the Hong Kong Sevens 2006 when uh, I was fortunate enough to be uh, score the winning try and kick the winning goal. And you know I think people have experienced that crowd when you see that crowd go off, especially when England win. It's it, it, it's pretty special. I think one of the other ones really then is having played in Twickenham for England in front of a home crowd. I was fortunate enough to play just after the World Cup in 2003 against the New Zealand Barbarians team. You know, it's a pretty impressive stadium. And when it's full, you know, those type of things stay in your mind for a while. There's a few. <laughs> not many. Getting Ever? smashed by Twinga Marl is not one of my favourites. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go back to sevens, eh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've spoken about it a few times. It took me a while to, to crack the Canadian team to play on the World Series. But uh, in that time, I, I got to watch guys like yourself. And you were one of the guys that, that I really looked up to on the series, being around the same size and playing the same way, except for I wasn't as good or as fast or as consistent. So I think you and I have discussed it a number of times over the last probably decade or more, but especially as we both transitioned into our coaching roles. And I talk about you a lot. And, you know, as much as any viewers or opposition looking at Johnny Wilkinson for goal uh, off a tee, you just feel that the ball is going to go in. He just has that sense of confidence and also that consistency. And, and I always felt the same both when I was, you know, a fan of the game and, and when I ultimately played against you and then after as your career led on is that you you were going to knock the ball through the post, whether you just ran 90 meters or set a guy up or it was in the corner and, and the wind was up. No matter what, you were just very, very consistent. We've had a few kickers on here on the Rugby Hive in the last last little while, but I'd really like you to dive in for those 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 kids, those those coaches out there and just those fans how are you so consistent out of hand? And I would say, on average, most kickers, the top end are maybe a 60, 70 percent tide. Oh, look, I think for me, if I look back at my childhood, I think it, it stemmed from there. I guess in some regards, a, a lot of people relate to the fact it was probably accidental learning at the time. I was very fortunate to have a relatively uh, big family with five brothers. So there was, always, there was always someone there to be able to kick a ball with. And I guess at the, at the time, it was really just, it didn't matter what type of ball or what size garden or where I was kicking it, I just would be continuously kicking. And I think I was able to just enjoy that part. But when I look back at it, I realised how important that probably was to, to later on in my rugby career in terms of the amount of time and hours I'd spent kicking a ball. And then obviously, as you move into a rugby ball, there were many hours spent with that. And it was just adapting that type of style. So I was, I, I was very comfortable when it came to kicking a ball. And, you know, as, as the years then went by, it moved from not just any ball, it was focused on the rugby ball. And I spent many hours kicking a rugby ball when I was at school. I used to stay behind every practice. I used to you know, work on the weekends. I was very, very fortunate. Again, my, um, I'll never forget him. He's my uh, original first 15 rugby coach. Uh, was a little Welshman. Uh, <laughs> and obviously they, they love their rugby. So he, he was, he, he really pushed me. We practiced no end. And, and one of the things I, I thank him for was that although I could kick ambidextrously at the time because of my football background, he actually, you know, made me really focus on both feet. And so in my early years, playing in, in the 15s in the Premiership, I used to kick to the touchline off either foot, right touchline, left foot, left touchline, right foot. You know, some people won't do that so much nowadays, but I, I, it did. It installed a confidence and I felt very comfortable with, with, with kicking and then adapting it with the drop kick became a fairly easy transition for me. So I think if I look back at it, I think the hours I just spent kicking the ball and then I was fortunate I had a few good people that uh, didn't overcoach me, but coached me well, tweaked me. And gave me the right focus and so more often than not I would always back myself I'm not sure I'd do it so much now but uh, <laughs> back then definitely so what would be your process so you're lined up for for a drop goal after you just scored what's what's going through your head yeah I think the first thing for me I mean particularly if we think sevens was just control the breathing to start try and get yourself back down to a point where you were breathing and, and again depended on which part of the field in front of the post I wouldn't think too much a couple of couple of breaths and, and knock it over and then make my way slowly back to the halfway line. That would probably be classified as uh, cheating nowadays as they've got a <laughs> clock on it, but I thought it was quite wise back then. <laughs> experience. <laughs> yeah, experience. But um, out wide, it was, it was a focus. I used to set myself up. I always had a way of angling myself on, uh, on the ball. I always would like the ball, the, the kind of the, the nipple or the valve to face the, face the area in which I was kicking. 
And then really it was just the focus was on the strike. Once I connected with the post, it was just a focus on on, on, on getting that strike and, and head down. And, uh, you know, I guess talk very often early enough. If you, if you know it's going to go through, the crowd's probably going to be your best indicator. So, you know, you don't need to look up, just focus on on, on, what, on, on what your process is. And that was that was it for me very much. And I guess fortunate enough to have to have done it so many times, it becomes pretty ingrained. And in those pre- you know, pressure environments, I say that, that's pressure environment is being on a field, playing for your country in wherever, if it was two men in a crowd or 100,000. And Ben, staying with kicking, restarts in the game of sevens and is the most important set piece. And it's teams practice that the, the most, right? One of the greatest yeah. combinations that we've ever seen on the series is you kicking off to Damu Damu, who's leaping in the air with one hand and smashing it backwards, almost taking off opposition players' heads. It goes back to England's side and you keep retaining possession. I remember playing against you and despite us scoring three or four tries, we just couldn't get the ball back off the restart. So even Blitzbock Frankie Horn mentioned that in our podcast with him. So tell us about perfecting that aspect of the game because it is really such a vital part. Well, I mean, I think the vital part, obviously, you know, you can't take anything away from, from Damu Damu. I mean, the guy was an outstanding athlete. I mean, a shame, really, he finished playing a bit earlier. But I think that was the way in which he played the game and the way his body was trying to hold up. But he was, he was incredibly brave in the air. And, you know, he just had this thing, you put it there, I'll go for it. And I guess for me, nowadays, they try to vary the height a little bit more. And, you know, they brought in the, the pod lifting and all the rest of it. But I'd always say to Damu, Damu, I'll kick it into the space and I'll just keep varying the height. You've got the timing. You get it there. And it didn't matter either side of the field. You could guarantee he was he was going to win it. And I think even now against pods, <laughs> I still think he would probably dominate that battle because he's, as long as he's in the air, obviously he's, 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 he's OK. You know, I think the ability to be able to play with players like that and, and, and have the confidence in yourself to know you'll put it where he needs it. It was the was the recipe, really. And that's exactly what Frankie said. Frankie said that he said he would get above the pod. So he said it was, you know, there's no way to get the ball back if you guys had it. Yeah. And I mean, I think for me, I've always had a thing when I was kicking, I would play with the pods. I was never going to kick directly to the pod. It may sound simple, but it didn't make sense to me. If I'm going to kick it, I'm going to make the move. And so I constantly was trying to play a little game. Of, well, if you stand there, I'm kicking it here. And as soon as you move to where you think I'm kicking it, I'm kicking it there. But, those types of things, I think, you know, you just, you play with people, right? I think that's in any sport. That's those little tactical uh, parts that you use. Certainly a long way off from my early days when I used to kick off a plastic pint mug. <laughs> those were the good old days. <laughs> you got two functions there, during practice and after practice. <laughs> well, I mean, when we first started playing sevens, obviously, the drop kick was only used once the game had started to kick off a game you kick off the tee which you know was quite interesting actually because we we adapted our tees <laughs> so that you could get as much height as you could i mean sandcastles was a mate was it with a key but uh, yeah it's amazing how the game moves on you obviously had a lot of success with england and i was on the and so was dallin on the receiving end of many of those so in total england have won 19 world series tournaments amazingly you played in 16 of those which means they've only had three since you retired in 2011. So we're wondering if you're making a, a comeback. What made your side so powerful and consistent during the first 10 years on the series? Oh, look, I think we were very fortunate in the level of player that we had back then, uh, the caliber of player and the togetherness of, of the team. I, interesting for me, see, I only played uh, latterly the one year when uh, sevens went full time. It was always a balance between sevens and fifteens, I guess. We were fortunate. We enjoyed that balance. Not most of us, if not all of us, in those in those, I guess, glory days in my career, were were playing for a Premiership 15s club at the same time. And more often than not, most of them were in the fringes of the England 15 squad. So we had some incredibly talented and strong strong athletes. I think we also were because we were playing rugby week in week out. Some thought we were very robust. We were able to withstand the rigors of the game. And we had a great connectivity and there was a good atmosphere in our, in our team. We, obviously, we, we, had, we were fortunate enough to have some fantastic coaches. In, uh, originally, it was uh, Joe Lydon, whose you know, rugby background from rugby league was, was in, in, incredible. He was, he was a fantastic coach and leader. And then where Mike Friday really, really picked up as well. You know, Mike, Mike and I actually originally started as roommates, nine and ten, and then <laughs> moved through our careers where Mike was coaching. And so... I think it was a recipe there that really worked for us. And we were fortunate. We had a, a really strong core element of the squad where there was a group of us that would play pretty much every tournament. And then we were able to bring in strength 
from, from those that were available at the time. And I think once we'd had a taste of victory early on in 2002, we realised that, uh, you know, there was some fantastic opportunities in this game. And, and I think that drove us. Um, I think our biggest regret, and I'd probably talk for a lot of players who've played for England over the years, I think not winning a World Series during that time was probably something where we let ourselves down as a team. Ben, to put you on the spot here, uh, you play with many great players for England. Which seven would you select in your starting side from your long-standing career? Gosh. Wow, I think you'd have Damu as a, as a, in, in one of the forwards. Tony Rokes probably as the other forward. Might be a flip-up. Potentially a Jamie Noon as a hooker. I don't know whether you guys remember Jamie Noon. He was an outside... He was a, he was a centre in 15s, but he was built. Half-back wise, I mean... I think Simon Amor speaks for himself. If I wasn't picking myself, <laughs> <laughs> if I put a different seven in there, you know, Henry Paul as a 10 or centre, probably Matthew Tate then as a 10 or centre, and then wings. I think we were, <laughs> we had a luxury there in the likes of Richard Horton, who's now refereeing. Probably my, my, my three would be an Hugo Monnier, Richard Horton, or a Strettle potentially. I've been burnt by all of those guys, so brilliant, <laughs> brilliant selections. <laughs> we, we, we did have an array of some, some, some real speed out wide. So, yeah, I mean, I think that would, uh, would be a pretty strong seven. I remember Matt Tate coming along and then Straddle and then Varndell showed up in Hong Kong. And I was just, where are these guys coming from? It's not even fair. We didn't have one of them and you guys are just growing them in England. So pretty impressive. Yeah. I, it was the first time I ever met a hair shaker because there wasn't a guy in Canada that their hair actually shakes when they got the ball. And I think I was playing a counties team uh, for the Vancouver Island Crimson Tide playing 15s. And it was a county side and there's a young man named David Strettle opposite of me, young guy. He was probably like 19 at the time and he was warming up just going through the paces in the backs and his hair just started to shake when he got the ball. And I knew I was, I knew I had my hands full because I was just a young guy myself on the wing. And yeah, he went around me a few times. And then when he showed up on the world series, I'm like, no, not again. David was uh, incredibly raw when he came onto the scene. He'd been playing uh, in the, in the championship at the time. I mean, obviously he was only 18 or 19. I think England sevens was, was a catalyst to the springboard of his career, really. I mean, he was a big part in the, the, the winning try that we ended up scoring. I ended up scoring in 2006, but he, he, he was just had a fantastic pace and then fantastic strength. You know, he wasn't built big, but you'd struggle to stop the guy and he would run through three or four tackles. And, and a bit different to some of the other guys, he really, you know, he was, his, his angle was not necessarily to run just around you, it was to run between you and just keep running. You know, he was, he was fortunate. I mean, I guess I probably missed out as well, someone in the likes of Dan Norton, who's now the, <laughs> the highest try scorer, but, you know, he, again, arguably they're all, all equals in that regard. All, all a good problem to have for the coaches. Can you just touch on, for me, I, I felt it was just so special, you and Amor. Like normally you have, you know, we had a Phil Mack or a Hiriyama, but having you two together, you had two winners in the side. And, and what was that, that like? I think it was, you know, for us, it was, it was great. You know, Simon and I had a, a great connectivity on and off the field. He understood the game and was an incredibly intelligent player and a good leader at the time as well. And, you know, we used to complement each other's styles. We, we, we knew and could rely on what each other were doing at the same time. There was, you know, you do, you know this with teammates, you get that kind of different type of communication system. You don't necessarily have to say it. You just see it and you know it. You're seeing the same things. You're on the same page. And I think, you know, it, it sort of seemed to work for, for a number of years that you had, you were able to build sides around Simon and I. And I guess he was probably more of the, uh, the leveller than I was. So there was a risk taker. It was probably more of myself and Simon. But, you know, I think that's what, again, you want in every team. And I think between us, we also both had a very strong want to win and, and want to succeed. And uh, that would drive through us and through the team as well. So, you know, it was, it was fantastic to have someone like Simon there playing. Neither of you are, are very tall, and, and I can say that because I'm not very tall myself. So at the time, you know, two, two of arguably the best players in the world and not that huge in stature. You got Morris Longbottom, Jerry 2Y, the Phil Max. It just, the list goes on and on. So you probably don't want seven of us smaller guys, but, you know, the second somebody like, like Longbottom or Jerry 2Y gets the ball, it just changes the whole game. And, and I think you guys really use that to your advantage. Yeah, and I think there was the beauty of playing sevens. Sevens, you know, is a, there's no question. It's an incredibly physical game and you have to be powerful and, and strong at the same time. But I liked it for its, uh, its cunning and its variant, you know, and the ability to really have the opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one with anybody 
on the field. And so when you came into a situation like that, size didn't really matter. You know, and we, we played against some big, big guys and big teams <laughs> over the years. And so for me, I think that's what kept me wanting to play sevens. I really loved 15s and I enjoyed everything I did in 15s because I enjoyed, again, the bats of the two. But sevens was that ability just to really unleash and, and be able to use everything in your, uh, in your toolbox when it came to, to beating people one-on-one. You spoke a bit about some of your early coaches in the sevens side. Can you, do you give us some insight what a young Mike Friday was like as a coach when he transitioned and later on Ben Ryan? Mike made the sensible decision that uh, post-playing, uh, at the time, the obvious position was for him to probably move into a coaching role because he was he was someone at the time who had been around the seven C more than a lot, you know, even with the likes of Joe Lydon. But um, I think he went away and he worked quite closely with Samurai Sevens and he got some more coaching under his belt. And I think as every coach does in their early days, they come in very enthusiastically to and, and, and they're, they're kind of learning on the job. But Mike's always been fairly, I think, straight in where he wants to go which is which has driven him and we had as players we had a good relationship with him as a coach and in regards to I think the team and the players that he had you know he he was very fortunate but understood also that it really it was a matter of being able to put the right combinations together and he would be very confident that we were able to to do the job at the time and you know he dealt with some characters and he dealt with them you know, he was able to create that balance in our side, which I think you come across in all teams. Um, you know, and I think it's it, it, it makes sense now as to why Mike is where he's at. Mike, I don't think Mike's changed too much in terms of his uh, steely look and his want to be very passionate on the sideline. But at the end of the day, that's that, that's that's who the person is. And uh, he gets a lot of uh, results because of it. It was very different, actually, because I think Mike probably would have stayed playing coaching England at the time. Um, but for certain reasons, he moved aside. And I think that left a bit of a hole within the uh, England England seven system. There was no really no one really else at the time. So Ben Ryan obviously uh, took up the reins, and I think uh, for Ben it was very different. It was a huge learning curve for a number of years. When he first took over the team, I wasn't playing actually. I kind of had a bit of a sabbatical. I was in Japan playing and had, had some time out. And the team was very different. Tough time in regards to the fact that uh, players weren't as ready available. It was harder to get players released, but I think the, 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 on the one side with Ben, he was very—he was at the time he was a good listener, and he, when I was again when I was involved, he did listen to the senior players, which I think is a smart thing to do as a coach, and and really work on how the players can control the situation whilst you you work things from behind. That's a mark of what good coaching should be, really. And I dare say, you know, again when he moved to the likes of Fiji, he learned a heck of a lot. <laughs> And it takes time to adapt. And I think once he'd adapted, obviously, he, he managed to get the best out of that Fijian team and ultimately uh, ending up with a gold medal. And Ben, can you touch on what was it like for you as a player transitioning from your professional 15s career to the Sevens World Series and back and forth? For me, I really enjoyed it. You know, when we were playing week in, week out with the grind of the English Premiership back in the day, I mean, obviously, that, that game has changed dramatically as well. But you had this kind of two-week break <laughs> where you could really unwind and unleash, and especially for players like myself, where the room really wasn't that much on, on those fields. And uh, you weren't being able to you know, have as much as an impact as you would like. So then you'd go away for two weeks at the time and come back feeling refreshed. There was not that much mud, obviously, because of the exotic places we used to get to play. <laughs> and then you'd come back and you'd jump straight back into the team and you just have this new energy. And I think, actually, your teammates used to see it. It more than anything and and also the it, the confidence to start taking players on and on you know you can get stuck in a grind right and then you start to narrow your focus and you don't use what you've got capable of the sevens used to take you out of that all of a sudden you had all this space the ability to beat people and you go straight back in and uh, and have a crack and so I really enjoyed the balance and I think the one thing that 15 is really rare where that helped my rugby career is the fact that if I look at it I never missed one tournament through injury and it's not to say that I didn't have my fair share of, of injuries I, at the at the time I was in any one tournament I was pretty much available to play in in every game and I think the fact was we were able to we you know our bodies were just used to a bit different now I know a lot of player welfare has probably come in I'll suffer a lot of it, which I know is, which is a sensitive subject so I don't get too far but yeah certainly I think that that played into our hands a lot and, and you know ultimately I loved playing rugby so if it meant say 15 one weekend 
sevens for a whole weekend the next, then, then, then so be it. Yeah, I think they, the two balanced out my rugby career very well. And these days, I think you brought it up to me a few years ago, but these days, all sevens matches, cup finals are 14 minutes. I really want to sink my teeth into what it was like to play in 20 minute cup finals. Now, I, I never played any World Series cup finals and uh, you were part of a pile of them. So what was that like? And then after that, uh, how do you feel about the, the transition of this generation getting off the hook or, or player welfare, as they put it? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do, I'll stay on this right now that I'm quite a big, big person within the player welfare area now. You know, I, I'm not saying we necessarily got it right. There's certain things that I, I do miss about the game. And I guess having transitioned out and obviously now the spectator, not the player, I really felt that the 10 minute finals created this ultimate spectacle at the end of a end of a long weekend as a player the mental battle you had was huge you know sevens we already know is incredibly physical and demanding on your body so number one I've just played five games you know I've just put my body through the mill oh and guess what I've now got to come and back up a 20 minute game so there was the physical aspect but then you know sevens is hugely mental and to think then, okay, I've got to get myself ready for how am I going to do it? You know, how's my body going to cope? I can, I can barely walk around the changing room, let alone think about playing 20-minute finals. But again, you put yourself in places you didn't think you could go and your body reacted well. When you got out on the field, it was a whole new tactical element. It changed the game. We used to play the clock, but I think rightly so. You know, it was a matter of where you can serve energy, do so. And in the game with the 10-minute finals, it was a very similar thing. You would see more kicks to touch in order to slow if you needed to, but if the time is right to speed up. And I think it also allowed, I feel like nowadays, if one team, you know, gets up and gets away pretty quickly in a final, generally they're going to come out winners. Whereas if you look back at some of the ding-dongs we had, you know, we won we won after two minutes, I think, in the final in 2006 in Hong Kong, after 20 minutes of rugby. I remember playing a final with Samoa where we ran the full... 20 minute final I think and then ran the first full five minute extra time and we then went into another five minutes so we'd almost been playing half an hour of sevens on a full weekend and we were like I remember when they eventually got a penalty and La La Lu is going to kick we were like please just kick it I don't think any of us can run anymore we'll concede the victory just because it's been a great game and I just think those things made sevens the, what it was back then and, um, you know, I understand now that these things move on and they change. But I do think that it was something that used to set the final apart from every other game in the, in the weekend. So I'm still, I'm, I would, if it could come back, I think it would be fantastic. And, and dare say, you know, those guys now wouldn't have experienced it. So they know no different in that regard. And they'd probably run, they'd probably say the complete opposite and not want to play an extra six minutes of sevens in a final. But I think they created some fantastic spectacles in the day. Well, sevens is the ultimate test. And, you know, the training that we would do in sevens compared to 15s. And, and it was always, you know, from one, whenever I bump into a Canadian alumni, they wouldn't talk about, you know, the last tournament or any success, it'd be, oh, I saw your fitness scores. I saw your beep test. I saw your Bronco, whatever it was. And, and that all led into, you know, the cup finals. How did that affect week two? So in Hong Kong, let's go back to 2006. You guys went at the death. I was on the sideline enjoying a cold one, I believe, and, uh, and cheering you on. And then obviously the following week in Singapore, like how does that affect you, you know, playing in that 20 minute cup final week two on tour? Well, I mean, interesting enough, just on that, that was week four for us we played the uh commonwealth games right. 10 days before and then had a slight break and then gone into it but we yeah you're right we went went straight to singapore to be honest with you i think back then if you let it affect you I, then i think it would affect you more the idea being was you were on a massive high from playing a final and i think you used that high to drive you through the week yet you were smart about the way you trained you, you know obviously things had gone well so you didn't need to go crazy on the training field tweak what you needed to tweak and really keep the the momentum and the kind of feeling you created from from the win and personally for me I never used to feel it took any more out of me I actually used to feel sometimes that a, a, a loss or a poor tournament would do more than, than than winning you know I mean ultimately as well we used we did used to celebrate our tournaments back then so uh probably take the first 24 hours to uh, to get that out of the system but we knew I think from a from a mental perspective we knew what was being expected of us we knew what our bodies needed to do 
And so we were professional in the respect that we, we spent the week getting ourselves ready physically and mentally for that, for that weekend. And uh, if anybody was feeling it within the team, you used the team, the rest of the team to pick them up. One thing we never did as an England team is we never did back up two wins. We did a lot of uh, win a final, lose a final, which is what we did that year. We lost to New Zealand in the final in uh, Singapore. Certainly, I think, you know, if you talk a lot about certain things, it can play more in your mind than, than you need to let it. And back then, it was a case of, what did I like doing? I love playing sevens. I'm now just gone from Hong Kong to Singapore. I'm on a high from winning. You know, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready again. And I, I, I want to taste that victory. Ben, I'm going to take you back to a quick story here. 2008, 2009, the Adelaide Sevens. Okay. Remember they had the scoreboard with the cricket, the cricket scoreboard and, and they had the numbers come up and stuff like that. So, this is my only story of us actually beating England during that era. And, and yeah, yeah. hold on, and hold on, we beat you twice in the same game. So I don't know if you recall this. It was the most bizarre thing I've ever seen as a player and as a commentator because in these these years we see a lot of stuff happen on the series. So I remember the game. The final whistle goal goes, and we think we've won by two points. And the referee blows the whistle, and we all leave the field. We've beaten England for the first time. And actually, I think you may have. I don't know. You know, you're available for every game, but I don't know if you were on the field at that exact moment. But either way, I remember thinking, "Wow, this is the team with Ben Gollings and everybody else." So we leave the field we go into our little tent and the referee comes over like three or four minutes later it was like actually guys it was a tie we had the score wrong on the cricket scoreboard can you guys come back and finish the game we're going to play like i think it was some knockout game sudden death and then we did get the restart chris wiles english american born english player of ours scored the winner so to this day that's the day we see we beat you guys twice your comments <laughs> <laughs> oh look I, I remember it well it was uh I mean, from an England perspective, I mean, obviously, from your perspective, it would have been fantastic. From an English perspective, there was, I won't go into all the detail, but obviously there was a, there was a lot of things playing behind the scenes at the time in terms of the selection of our team and quality player. And I think also Adelaide in itself. I mean, if, if ever I had strange tournaments, I think Adelaide was the one that used to throw it up a lot. But I do remember the game well, having, I guess, accepted defeat as, uh, as well as I could at the time. <laughs> so then... Uh, we told we had to come back out and play. I mean, stranger things have happened. And again, with sevens, you have to adapt. And I think I do remember us needing to really win. I think you may have not just beaten us, but I think that had put the nail in the coffin in terms of it may have been our final pool game, if I'm not wrong. And you, that was us uh, knocked out of the... Uh, and I think we then did not win a game all weekend. So it was a... <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Dallin. Appreciate that. <laughs> hey, hey, it's only Ben. It's only one highlight we have of those three years. So we we got to take it. Right? I just thought oh, it was so no. so crazy to put you on the spot again. Right? So you can't select Robin or myself, obviously. But which seven players that you played against over your era would you put into your dream team? Now these are players you played against. This these aren't English English players. Boy, um, well, I think Eric Rush would have to uh, would have to go in there. I think probably someone the likes of uh, Fat Saliva as another as another prop hooker. You probably yeah, I think maybe I think he was a prop, but Frankie would probably would uh, probably put a uh, make that three pretty strong. I mean, Sarevi, you can't go very much past that guy in terms of his his capabilities as a ten. I, I, I put two. I mean, you guys may remember. Do you remember a Massio Valance? So you, you flip a coin between a Massio being as a nine as well, but uh, then a Roni IE. I mean, that guy, I don't think I've come across a sidestep like it when he was in his prime. I mean, if you had to mark the guy one-on-one, -on -one, it was not it was not a happy place. <laughs> As a centre, oh, gosh. You're going to draw back over a number of years, right? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. You played um, against 10 years of, of stars. <laughs> yeah, Fra yeah, Frankie, I mean, Frankie could put together, he said, five or six teams, which we all could, right? So it's tough to just to choose one in each position. Yeah. Look, I mean, and some of the wingers we used to play back, I mean, when I was originally started playing, I didn't actually play against him because I missed it in the World Cup, but Joan Lomo was playing. So you probably put him in there somewhere. Let, let's face that fact. Uh, <laughs> um, and probably someone like the likes of a Tutavaki as well as a centre or a Philomone Dallasau between, between there somewhere. So, you know, I mean, I'd probably be biased, but back in our day, some of the... Uh, particularly with some of the New Zealanders and Fijians you used to come up against were, were pretty phenomenal. I mean, there's a guy that I was actually a bit of a mentor and grew up with, Viliami Satala. I'd probably throw him in. If, he, if he's not in the seven, he's probably a close eight. Um, I mean, he, he, he single-handedly destroyed New Zealand in the final of uh, Hong Kong in 2005 in the World Cup. Like, just 
But yeah, I mean, I guess on the one side, if I look at it, I was very fortunate to play against some fantastic rugby players during my time. Yeah, that's an epic squad indeed. So let's let's switch it up a bit. Let's talk about your transition to being a coach. You know, over the last few years, how has that been? Yeah, I think uh, as a coach, I used to coach when I was playing, um, and I was I guess always had a passion to to coach. And then um, transitioning out of the sevens world and into coaching for me, you you want everything to happen very quickly, and it's not necessarily that way because not all great players make great coaches right and I think I've, I've understood that over the years so I've worked hard to develop my coaching and, and give it a different focus and, and not just rely on that knowledge and experience that I gained over so many years as a player on the field but I think if I can talk about it there was a bigger thing at play at the time and for me I won't go into all the detail but I wasn't ready to retire when when my rugby career especially sevens came to an end it happened very left field uh, I wasn't expecting it at all and I didn't probably realise how much that played on me as a person over the next seven or eight years of, I guess, my transition from, from playing. And it probably changed me as a person. And it, it made me fight a lot, probably in my own mind, as opposed to outwardly. And so I, I got very frustrated with a, with a lot of stuff. And like I said, it, did, it, it has taken me and I've, I've been through my own problems with it. But I guess for me now, stepping back about it, I've still got things I want to achieve with coaching. I guess I, the difference being with coaching, you've got more time than playing. <laughs> you can only play the game for so long. Coaching-wise, as long as you're capable and you do a good job, you can coach for many more years. So I, I haven't actually, in theory, coached on the World Series since I stopped playing, which if you ask me, it's been a frustration. It is what it is. I fought that originally. I don't fight that now. I've uh, focused on, I guess, what I can control and what, what I'm able to, to influence. And so, you know, lastly, I, uh, I guess with my coaching, I've had some incredibly humbling and fun experiences along that journey. You know, I went to Sri Lanka and it's not just about winning team. It's about the people you work with. And, you know, I learned so much coaching those guys in the early years as, as people and the way in which those types of countries run. And they just come out of a war. So it was an incredible time. I've been fortunate enough to coach China and, uh, you know, wow, I mean, how long do we have that was a that was an incredible <laughs> that was incredible but you know i'm so happy to see that having finished there that they've kept the momentum and they're now qualified you know it was our goal to qualify for the olympics but it was probably a bridge too far with the japanese team at the time but now they've qualified it's fantastic so when i again and that's where covid's been so beautiful when you can take a bit of a step back and, and get out of the hook you know, the fast lane, which life does throw at you because there's a lot there for you to, to get hold of. The influence that you can have on people in coaching and, and, and the difference you can make in their lives, I think for me is the bit that I, I really enjoy. And, you know, if the opportunity does arise to get on the World Series and, and work with the team at some point, and I have had a taste of it lately, working with Henry Paul and the Canadian team, then, you know, fantastic. I, I guess I believe in myself that I've got a lot of knowledge to part and, and that, you know, I feel something that drove me as a player was to get the best out of myself. And if I can do the same with players, and uh, that's, that's what drives me as a coach. Well, we really appreciate you being open and honest about, you know, your, your coaching path and your playing career. Uh, my first impression of, of Ben Gollings, again, as I said earlier, I grew up watching him. I grew up watching him around the same age. Obviously, uh, he was on the World Series a number of years before I was. And being that Dubai is, is another satellite uh, of the UK and Ben being the hottest ticket in town and, and just the poster boy of the Dubai Sevens in 2005 when I debuted. The post-competition uh, celebrations, uh, Ben was being mobbed by everybody and, you know, first thing he did was uh, went out of his way to shake my hand and just all I could think of was class. You know, this guy's, you know, at the top of his game and he was just class and, and that just set the expectation for me as was Sarevi in those days and still is. But you got the best players in the world and there's not too many sports where you can have a gentleman like that, uh, you know, and, and in respect to our program at that time, we were relatively minnows uh, in the bottom eight of most competitions. So that really set, you know, set the expectation for me as, as I made made my way through uh, the World Series and, you know, such a humble and kind, hardworking guy. Can you share some of your, your current projects across Australia and overseas that you're working on these days? Yeah, sure. And I appreciate that. Uh, those words are uh, very kind. Yeah, you know, I think just just to add to that, I, I think the lovely thing about Sevens was the ability to have that opportunity to mix with different countries and different cultures. And uh, I think once all the playing on the field had been done, it was something I used to I used to enjoy. You know, I used to love 
being able to talk to others and learn learn about how they were doing it. Like if you can pick something up, you can pick something up. But since since playing now and and, and where I'm at, so primarily what I've been doing, I live here on the Gold Coast. So I do a lot of consultant coaching, particularly in Asia, where I guess uh, it's not too far away. And I think one of the things there is it's not just working with the teams, it is working with the coaches. So I'm a big, I really enjoy um, the coach development side of things, which is, uh, you know, is it, I think as players, often you get the support of your teammates. As coaches, you can be quite isolated. So to be able to have, as a coach, and I, I would like this if I was coaching a team, to be able to have somebody there to be able to talk with. It's not about trying to tell them how to do something. It's about trying to question them. As a player, you want to be questioned. And I think as a coach, if you're comfortable about it being questioned, it, it really helps because, it, you know, it either backs up what you're thinking or it gives you something else to think about, both both positives. From there, um, I do a lot of ambassadorial work. I've been doing quite a bit with, uh, again, some of the tournaments. And the lately as well, I've been working quite closely with athletes of all levels within the kind of mental performance space which has been really really interesting really exciting you know having gone through gone through some of the things I went through I it's something I focused on it's obviously a big big thing nowadays COVID's highlighted it even more but it's really uh it's really about trying to uh get the best out of out of the athletes and and steer them in the right direction you know and any any piece of knowledge again you can pass on or if you can relate it to a story I think they really absorb that which has been which has been exciting COVID yes yeah, put a bit of a dent in, in in actually being able to physically get out on the field and coach <laughs> people at this time but post that um, is really to pick up where I left off and and, and get back in, in in the coaching realms working with coaches working with teams again if there's the opportunity to get into a World Series team I would love that and then on the other side I I've also, I think the other thing that keeps me busy is I've been working on a bit of a business uh, angle with some people in the UK, uh, which is partly in the player welfare development side as well, which is which has been interesting. And I think to have that balance, I've learned is very is very helpful because it uh, it gives you a bit of escapism from from rugby at times. Yeah, great insight there, passing on your knowledge and especially that mental strength and mental awareness as well. That, that's huge, you know. Ben, let's keep something on the lighter side. You've been on more tours than Vas- Vasco da Gama. Who would you rank as some of your worst roommates and why? <laughs> a simple one, Josh Lucy. It was a shocker. The fact that he used to get up at all hours and drink protein shakes was just an absolute nightmare. <laughs> nightmare in itself i'm gonna throw him under the bus but my latest and uh, you know the, the guy i ended up rooming with a lot of my latter years was uh known as Rumi, but matt turner <laughs> he's matured a lot recently but when i was running around he's still quite a young lad and it used to annoy the hell out of me waking up in the middle of the night with the tv still being on in the room i don't know whether he still does it but he had a habit he could never go to sleep without it on and he'd never turn it on <laughs> but so i'm trying to think who else now I mean, gosh, I think generally my word of view is if you could get with a back, I was happy. If I was with a forward, not not quite so. They're, they're a different animal, those guys. <laughs> Anyone that snores is a no-no. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess being a senior player in a team, there was one advantage. You could always pick. <laughs> Boy, well, I have a Josh Lucy story. I, I was at the Calgary Stampede, the infamous Calgary Stampede, the world's greatest outdoor show, in conjunction with the the Stampede Sevens, a couple of years after playing on the World Series, middle of the dance floor at this rodeo bar with all the boys, and Josh Lucy pops up in the middle of our dance circle by himself, just taking in the Calgary Stampede. Uh, you know, former England legend and spent the night with him having a good time. He was down to earth and I've got the pictures to prove it. Yeah, just super random. Didn't have to share a room with him though. I'll throw that out there. He was he was an incredibly intense person, Josh Lucy. I mean, he'd be very successful, but as a player, yeah, he was the type of guy that if you were playing a friendly game, he would, and it was touch, he'd never stop and he'd sprint the full length of the field to score the try. <laughs> <laughs> he was committed, I'll give him that. Love the insight. All right. What what advice would you give athletes that aspire to play to your standard of excellence out there? Oh, I think first of all, first and foremost, really enjoy what you're doing. I think that has to be a, a, a big factor. If you love what you're doing, you, 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 are, you will be successful. I think the other one is, it, it goes without saying, really, it's the commitment and the time and, and the work put in is, is generally what, what, what you're going to get out. Um, there's no easy 
there's no easy way to it. Um, but again, if you love doing it, that does make it easier. And, and, and practice, practice, practice. You know, I've, I've learned. And it's, it's as much to practice by yourself or with someone where you can learn things as much as with your coach as well. You've got to be able to go away and practice something to bring it back to a coach to be able to work out where things may be going wrong or right. Would be, would be what I'd be saying. I mean, it's, it is an incredibly intense arena out there in the, in the athletic world. Um, anything that you can do that gives you a, a slight edge or can put yourself in front of something, that's, that's what you should be doing. So if it's training on days when people aren't training, etc., then that is the, uh, the key. Ben, we just want to thank you so much for, you know, A, providing so many highlights on the field and, and giving us this insight, you know, post your playing career. I know Robin's got a frame poster of you in his bedroom. Uh, so this is even more <laughs> thrilling for him as well. Uh, so thanks for joining the Rugby Hives. Hey, guys, thank you so much. It's been awesome. Beautiful ball out the top. Yes, Seppo! Thank you for listening, you sleek sensations. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Rugby Hive Podcast. And catch us on all the socials at Rugby Hive. We appreciate your support. Be safe out there and we'll see you soon. They've taken the lunch money from Sunday.